Okay, welcome to a special Women's History Month edition of Book Sandwich Gin. I'm Rory Martirana. I am an adult services librarian in the reference department at the New Haven Free Public Library. Um, today I'm joined by Karen Carbo. Karen's the author of numerous award-winning novels, memoirs, works of nonfiction, including her best-selling Kick-Ass Women series and the book we're going to discuss today in praise of difficult women. Her short stories, essays, articles, and reviews have appeared in Elle, Vogue, O, Esquire, The New York Times, and other magazines. Karen's a recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Fiction, uh, an Oregon Book Award for Creative Nonfiction, and the winner of the General Electric Younger Writer Award, and one of 24 writers selected for the Amtrak residency. And she's zooming in all the way from France to be with us today. Welcome, Karen. Hi, Rory. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, so plenty of stuff to discuss today. It's a great book. Um, I wanted to start sort of by, uh, quoting a little excerpt really quickly. Um, in your introduction, you wrote, a difficult woman, as I define her, is a person who believes in her that her needs, passions, and goals are at least as important as those of everyone around her. In many cases, she doesn't even believe they're more important. Um, many women in this book were devoted loving wives and mothers, but simply as important. A difficult woman's also a woman who doesn't believe the expectations of the culture in which she lives are more important than what she knows to be true of herself. She's a woman who accepts that sometimes the cost of being fully human is upsetting people. A difficult woman is a woman who insists on inhabiting her full range of humanity. So when I read this and, and your um, descriptor of the criteria for, for a difficult woman was much longer than that. Um, but that's just highlights from it. The description, it seemed to me, um, speaks of a lot of women. I don't know if I'm just uh, in difficult woman crowds. Um, so what aspects of that definition really sets a difficult woman apart? Um, or are we all difficult women in our own ways? Well, you sort of, you, 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 you turned the last card over, Rory, and figured it out, is that, um, you know, part of the introduction was meant to be a bit playful, which is that um, it takes so very little in our culture to be called a difficult woman. And, you know, part of my goal in writing the book was so that all women, regardless of how we live our lives and regardless of how um, how people view us is that we just are able to take that moniker difficult and really let it roll off our backs, own it, and not let it be such a um, such an insult or such a wound. You know, I think we don't like to be called difficult, um, generally speaking, and it's a word. Um, at least in the English language, that is used really whenever a woman does something that makes it um, inconvenient for other people, makes her um, disagreeable. You know, it's 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 a it's a slur that is flung at women when they don't, um, as my mother used to say, go along to get along. So yes. Um, Many of us, many of us are difficult women simply for that reason. Of course, there are, and, and in the book too, I talk about there are kind of, kind of sort of these superhero difficult women. Um, but by and large, I, I think that, you know, anytime um, you dare to put your needs and desires ahead of somebody who doesn't want you to, you risk being labeled difficult. But you know, I should also say, um, Rory, you know that this book came out in 2018, and it was written over. Um, it, it was actually even begun before the 2016 election. So between then and now, the world is 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 unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. so, you know, things that things that we were concerned about and things that we were really talking about and focused on um, were the things of that time. So now, I just think all women who, you know, the, the burden that women are bearing um, during the pandemic, I just think they're, you know, however we are all getting through it, 
um, and all the things we're doing for everyone else that everyone just needs to, <laughs> to be appreciated for exactly everything that she's contributing because it, you know, it, it, like I said, it was a different time when the book came out. Yeah, yeah. That you can, you can tell too from like some of the, some of the chapters, like you were writing about Rachel Maddow and I forgot about all that stuff. <laughs> remember? Yeah. Like, oh God, remember that? Like a million years ago, feels like a lifetime, right? Right? Or um, you know, and someone you, well, someone who um, I, I don't know is not on the radar, whatever we we want to say now, um, but who affected me deeply was Lena Dunham mm -hmm. when Girls first came out. Yeah, but it yeah. does seem like it was a hundred years ago now. You know, um, it really does does seem like, I mean, I think the, the, I think the show and her approach and the things that she was trying to say about kind of regular women and their bodies, it still is valid, mm -hmm. but, but it does seem, um, you know, even, even as all books become dated, like, because we're living in this kind of super speedy time when every day it's a new thing, um, I think it really is kind of poignant that the book is not that old and yet some of the concerns seem like from a different time. Yeah, yeah. Um, on that note, uh, I wanted to know, so some of the women you profile, like you mentioned Lena Dunham, uh, um, although that probably doesn't, at the time of the publication, like Lena Dunham, not so controversial. JK Rowling, not so controversial. So <laughs> yeah. not necessarily them for this question, but like Hillary Clinton, or Coco Chanel or, or like Liz Taylor, who like everyone says stole, um, Debbie Reynolds' husband, like some of them are more um, divisive than others, like Amy Poehler or like Jane Goodall. Um, how did you select all 29 of the women in the book? And um, did you aim for a balance between more controversial and universally liked people? Or did it just pan out that way? Um, how did that work? That's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think a book like this, you know, you could almost play a party game where everyone could name their 29 difficult women and it would be different for everyone. Um, one of the, when the, I first started thinking of the book, I really wanted to, um, uh, well, it's, that's another story. The, the book sort of went through a permutation in the writing because it was original, I, I got my book contract in 2015. And the idea was to write about sort of historically significant women who had gotten us to this time where we were going to have our first woman president. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the foundational difficult women like Amelia Earhart and Jane Goodall and Martha Gellhorn, um, they were sort of people that, women who had really inspired me as a young woman um, to follow my dreams and believe in myself and so on and so forth. But then after the election, it became clear that our job was not done yet in terms of standing up for ourselves and being ambitious and so on and so forth. So the book kept moving um, as history sort of went on. But one of the things that I held true to is that, is that I had to find something interesting about them personally something they did or a way that they lived their life had to be personally interesting or meaningful to me. Um, otherwise I felt like it would sort of just be like encyclopedia entries, you know? So I had to really, um, and, and you know, some of the women, like one of the, the women who I love the most, love and I say love because she was, she was an incredibly difficult and probably crazy woman um, was Ava Perone who was um, you know, the, you know, Evita, as I think we all know her the most from the musical Evita, but um, she was Juan Perón's wife and completely changed the face of Argentina. Um, so she was just someone I found completely fascinating. She was someone who, you know, came to her position of power and had no credentials for the job and yet completely believed in, in you know, what she thought was true. Um, so, like I said, it, they were very, very personal. Um, with the, the women and, and how they were in life were very personal to me. So, um, so it's not in any way kind of an objective rendering. Um, and yes, yeah, some people, um, well, well, it's interesting because when I went on my book tour, 
all the people who um, seem to be difficult um, in the interest of making the world a better place, people were kind of more more willing to accept their personalities. But as you said, someone like Elizabeth Taylor mm -hmm. um, or um, uh, Edie Sedgwick, they were like, well, why should we like her? It's like, well, that's not actually the point. And you, by the way, made my point. You know, being likable is exactly what this is not about. <laughs> So, so um, that's a long way to answer your question. It was very, very subjective. Um, it's interesting too. The um, like the title of your book kind of drew me to it um, because that's a big thing for me. Like frequently, people say I'm difficult uh, or a lot to handle, or you know, like over the top. Um, and it's like it's in situations where if a man were behaving the way I was he would be assertive and a go-getter and, you know, stuff like that. So um, it was pretty exciting to see like a, a whole collection of other women who have, you know, rattled people for being passionate about something. Um, that's, well, that's, that's really that's, cool. yeah, I, I just feel like I would really love, love for you to, to, yeah, just let that roll off your back. I'm sure you will, you know, I mean, I think, um, I'm hoping, you know, younger generations of women don't have to wait until they're 50 years old to learn this stuff, you mm -hmm. know. Um, you know, it's so interesting because people have also asked, like, how did you come up with difficult as that word? Um, and there was never any um, option that, that it would be anything else. And, you know, something had happened to me when I was a kid in kindergarten, as it turned out. And, um, you know, it was back in the time when kids would go to kindergarten and they would have a very strict schedule like this is painting time and this is nap time and this is reading circle time. And, you know, you move through your day like that. And I would get very, um, when, if we had to move from like painting time in particular, I remember to whatever was next and I wasn't finished with my painting, I would act out and really misbehave. Um, and the reason why I gave when they called in my parents to the parent conference is that I wasn't finished and I wanted to finish it. Mm -hmm. And there was no thinking in those days that they would say, well, maybe you can come in during recess or maybe like there was no, you know, and the teacher said to my parents, she's just being difficult. Like that was the assessment, not that I had any reason for wanting to not move on, but that I was just being difficult. Now, maybe a boy would have been accused of the same thing, like he's just being difficult, but somehow that doesn't sound right, does it? He's no. just, no. I was just being difficult. I was just giving the teacher a hard time. I was just being inconvenient because my parents had to make time to come in for the, you know, so that sense that when you are just doing something that you want to do, if you are inconveniencing other people, you get called difficult, has been with me for a very long time. And as you said, it's all around us. Oh yeah, all over the place. Um, I wanted to ask you, let's see, it's, you kind of answered, I was gonna ask who you're most fond of and why, but um, on the other side of that, um, did you profile anyone you're not? I'm not fond of, you're kind of, you have frozen. So do you um, profile anyone you're really fond of? Not fond of, not fond of. I'm assuming you're saying not fond of because you are frozen on my screen. Um, well, you know, the thing is with all writing is that you you like what you're doing at the beginning and then as you work on it and work on it more and more and more, you get sick of pretty much everything. So there was, I think, probably a time when I didn't like any of them because I felt like I had written, you know, drafts and drafts and drafts and, and you know, trying to encapsulate someone's life in this way in these sort of shorter essays was a feat in and of itself. So, um, I, you know, I, I went into it being intrigued or attracted to all of them. 
Um, and then, you know, at the end, like I said, I, I think I, I probably did not want to go to a cocktail party with any of them after I had, had completely finished it. Um, you know, something that you mentioned um, when we were talking beforehand is, you know, sort of the notion of Coco Chanel, mm -hmm. who I also had written a book about. She's one of my, um, my um, kick-ass women in the gospel according to Coco Chanel. And um, yes, her role in World War II was not in any way very honorable. Um, I will say that I think her motives were from pure selfishness as opposed to any kind of political uh, mission. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing is too, now that I live in Europe and World War II, um, and all, well, all the wars, there's been a gazillion of them, um, you know, they just, their, their, their understanding of what people do during war and what, what people have done or haven't done, um, you know, it, they take it a bit differently, not that, not, not to excuse, um, her actions. I, I, I don't know if people realize this, but she, um, during World War II, she had an affair with um, a younger man who um, turned out to be working for German intelligence. I'm sure there was pillow talk. I'm sure she, I, I don't know if she passed on secrets or whatever, but I think it's also really important and I have never read this anywhere. It's also really important that first of all, she already went through one world war. And I mean, not, not to, uh, you know, she was also a menopausal woman who was being courted by a young, handsome guy. And she was obviously very into, you know, sort of how she looked and how she presented herself. And I think on a very human level, why wouldn't she say yes to that? A thing that struck me about, um, cause I knew about that before reading the book, um, but the, kind of, she kind of benefited from Jewish people not being able to own a business. That's the part that's like harder for me to, to forgive. Um, but I'm, she, you know, I'm, no. I'm from the standpoint in, you know, 2021 where, um, like, I don't know. No, it, I don't, it's like, I don't. that's iffy to me uh, about her. I think it's, inc I think it's incredibly iffy. Mm -hmm. Um, I think she was not, I mean, do we say a good person as we, as we, um, you know, evaluate people? Was she someone who literally made, you know, made a life out of nothing she was? And we are, are we only allowed to do that if we're good people? Well, then it also brings up the, um, it's sort of like uh, men acting like difficult women would get praised for that behavior. It's sort of like um, how many horrible men are out there in like the tech industry and all over the place, like being hailed as these heroes and these gods and they're terrible people, um, like objectively. So um, like I can see, why you would include her. Um, that chapter was was hard for me just because I knew a little bit about her background. No, um, but then I at the same time, it's people. like, you know, I can uh, I can like apologize for Steve Jobs, but I can't, you know, so. No, you make a really good point. And, um, you know, I mean, I thought about it a lot and I read a lot about it. Um, and, uh, like I said, it it, it 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 didn't sit well with me either. But then I wondered, does that mean she shouldn't be included? Like, do I want difficult women who are only kind of difficult light, you know, or do I want women that have actually done bad things? So, um, if anyone in the audience has questions to chime in, feel free. Um, in the chat box on Zoom or the comments on Facebook, or there's a Q and A. Uh, button at the bottom of your screen on Zoom if you want to remain anonymous. Um, feel free to send those over and we'll, we'll get them to Karen for you. 
Um, let's see. So back to the book. So the the number 29, I was wondering if there was a significance about that number, um, why you wouldn't just round it to 25 or, or 30, um, or was it like you, the publisher said, let's do 29? Um. <laughs> I mean, as I'm sure you know from, from talking to authors that, you know, everything, it's all a creative process. So it's, you know, and yes, it did start with 30. And number 30 was um, Indira Gandhi. And, in, you know, I, I really wanted to try and be as, you know, keeping, keeping close to what I found interesting and inspiring myself, because that was my first goal. I also really wanted to try and be as diverse as possible. So, you know, Indira Gandhi, of course, is an incredibly interesting woman, was the leader of India, brought India into the, the modern era. But, you know, when I got to the place where she was, um, and I guess this is, this is the line for me, <laughs> when she was involuntarily sterilizing Indian women, that was, I, I called my editor, I said, I can't, I can't do it. Um, and I said, you know, I don't, and they were like, well, who else could I said, I, she, they were saying and it was very late. And I kept trying to, you know, to, in, a, in a way that I was not being difficult, I was trying to kind of fit Indira Gandhi into this, and it just was not sitting right well with me. And so I said, look, there's nothing wrong with the number 29. Because first of all, in the old days, they used to say never trust anyone over 30. And 29 is like, it's a prime number, it's a young number, it's an interesting number. So I had to sell them on 29 because they wanted me to wedge someone into 30. And I said, no, because I wouldn't, I couldn't find anything beyond, like I said, the enforced sterilization of Indian yeah. women. I couldn't, I couldn't do that, so. Uh, if you could do an updated edition today and maybe like add a couple people in, who might you? It's true, right? And not maybe, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, someone I had wanted to include um, that I didn't was like Anita Hill I wanted to include. Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing is with the way the whole thing came together is that we had sort of wanted to balance it between entertainment and Art, the arts and politics and you know so it was I mean I would have had tons more writers than anyone would have ever been interested in so I think when I we discussed Anita Hill it was like we already have a lot of lady politicians you know so there was a lot there was a lot of back and forth with my editors so I would include her I would include AOC I would I would include I think I might include Yoko Ono who's still with us um, but, but it's interesting. It's interesting that, you know, um, I will say, you know, once you write a book that has historical and biographical essays of 29 human beings, all with different lives, you kind of don't want to do a revised edition. <laughs> you kind of are done with it. <laughs> what was your approach to research? Um, or did it depend on the person you were writing about? Well, that's an interesting question because, you know, um, obviously each of these women have had, I mean, most of them have had many books devoted to their lives. So, and what was I going to bring to the table that was going to be any different? And how was I going to um, talk about these, the, the parts of their lives or their personality characteristics that were quote unquote difficult? So, um, each woman not only has, you know, her own chapter, but she also has a word, an adjective, um, that's a more precise adjective that describes a way in which women are difficult. So they're stubborn, they're outspoken, they're um, ambitious, um, you know, they're bold, so on. So once I had each, so, you know, I did initial, I, I read sort of all of the, um, all of the major works of them. But then once I did that, I got a sense of the, of the way in which they were difficult. And so then I started really focusing on that 
um, and parts of their lives that then would illustrate that word. That's good. I was going to ask you too about those those one word descriptors. They were right. I was curious about that if you had um, gone into it with them or and they led you somewhere. But like it's it's neat that um, that was kind of well. It was a way. To, yeah, it was a way to focus it. Otherwise, I would still be writing this book. I'd be probably still on the first essay. You know. Um, so so you know once I had sort of a general idea of her life, once I had. Um, a sense of the way that she exhibited her ambition or exhibited her outspokenness or exhibited her recklessness or whatever, um, then I would then I would really focus the research on things that happened that would further illustrate that. Uh, so we have a question. Um, Debbie asked, is your book published in French? And if so, how has it been received by um, in France and in Europe in general. That's interesting. It has not been published in French. Um, there is um, a UK edition. And, um, you know, I have to say, just generally speaking, as an American, they were um, people who know about the book and who, whom I've discussed the book with felt um, interested and I think um, I think impressed is maybe too big of a word, but you know, I included Angela Merkel, for example, who's the, the, the chancellor of Germany. Um, and Coco, Coco Chanel was an, another one that we've discussed. Um, and Vita Sackville West, who's English. And so I just think that, that you know, the perception of Americans and um, you know, whether it, it, it's accurate or not, um, the perception of Americans is that we're very insular and we don't really think that there's a whole world of difficult women. We just think, you know, that, <laughs> you know, so it would it would make sense for an American writer to only have American women. So I think that that they really were interested in talking about Angela Merkel or Eva Perón or you know these these women from from other countries that that um, you know I interesting because not only did I have to perceive the way in which they were difficult, but you know we are all um, you know, the daughters of the time in which we're born. We're all part of our, our own generation and the time in which we came up and what the um, culture was like then. So, you know, what did it mean to, you know, be Ava Perone and be considered difficult? What did it mean to be Angela Merkel and be considered difficult? Because it's different from, from what, you know, an American experience, female experience of being difficult is. So it was kind of like the, the level of difficulty in achieving this went up a little bit. Um, you know, so, so I think that that was mostly it, that they were just interested that, that it, you know, that I had sort of thrown the net um, a bit wider. You know, not that there aren't many, many, many other women in Europe. And of course, now that I live here and now that I'm reading French news and, um, you know, there's a, um, a wonderful book that I've um, just come across called, in fact, I have it, it's right here. What's her name? Lindsay Tramuta called, wrote a book called The New Parisian. And it's about kind of French difficult women that, you know, that there's this, this image of the Parisian woman who just is like thin and tousle hair and mysterious and, um, you know, this, this, you know, babe magnet. And, but, you know, really there's a lot of difficult women in Paris doing super interesting things right now that don't, that don't meet that stereotype. So um, yeah, now that I'm here, I see that, you know, that there are many, many, many different kinds of difficult women, um, which is obvious, but I guess it takes living in a place to really have it um, sink in. Um, so let's see, uh, someone asked, did you do any personal interviews or um, were all the women dead? Uh, obviously they weren't, but um, did you do I, or if not, what? You like, know, it's interesting. I had done some personal interviews, but I had done them on different occasions. Um, for example, Billie Jean King, I had profiled um, for a magazine piece, but, um, and I actually had also met Hillary Clinton very briefly. Um, but I, I really tried to have the, um, the essays be more sort of personal essays as opposed to a kind of journalistic interviewing of 
of um, the women. And in part, that was because obviously it would be um, quote unquote unfair to the dead people because I could never talk to them. Um, and so we had, we had tried initially with some of the women I had met and what happened was those essays then did not seem like they were the same as the other essays. So there were a lot, there's a lot of moving parts in this book for sure. Yeah. Um, so Eileen asked, this is a great question. Um, what description would you char characterize yourself with um, and why? And did you decide to go in this direction because you yourself had struggled with this topic? Th that's a very complicated long, that's that yeah. question. Yeah. It's a couple things. Um, Yes, I think that, you know, and I think all writers will, um, you know, if they will fess to this is that that most of the time we choose what we're going to write about because we we want to learn. We want to learn more about it. We want to um, we want to go on that journey of writing the book so that somehow we can absorb the material. And so it's as much about the reader as it is obviously about the writer in that regard. Um, and I think, yeah, I think in mo I mean, most of the people in my life who I'm close to would, would say this is not true, I think. But I do feel like um, there have been times when um, I've just thought it was simpler to not be difficult and go along to get along than, um, you know, say, no, I'm not doing that or um, let's talk about this. Let's, you know, I, I think that that I have been historically um, and trained by my mother, um, as we often are, to just, oh, it's just, just say yeah, just do it and get it over with. Well, I don't want to do it. I don't, it's a waste of my time, or I don't actually believe in it, or I just don't want to do it. I would rather spend, but you know, I grew up, it's like, oh, just honey, just go. Oh, it'll make, it'll make your aunt so happy. Just do it. Just you know, just do it, just go, just say yes. So I, you know, so, and I would see these other women like Amelia Earhart or Jane Goodall or all, you know, and I would think, I bet they didn't do that. I bet they just got called difficult and they were like, yes, that's true. And went along with their business. So I do think it was something that I wanted to absorb. That said, I think people in my life would say I was stubborn. Because once I get it in my head, um, and you know, I think sometimes it reads as selfishness because to be stubborn, if you're a woman, you know, if you're going to adhere to something, sometimes you have to really inconvenience people around you. Sometimes, you know, if you're stubborn, I mean, something, something that, and this is a, a whole different area is that, you know, um, in the workplace, women, you know, I think in, in, you know, contemporary times, women are expected to have um, opinions and they're expected to have their own opinions. But I think what, you know, if you're in a meeting at work and you don't come off, it, you don't see consensus, you're seen as being difficult. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just think getting better at all of that, getting better at, yes, I have my opinion, but I'm not going to change it so that there's no conflict in the room. That's something I've struggled with a lot too, that I'm just now starting to be more assertive about. Um, but I feel like had there not been a whole pandemic and all these social issues coming to the forefront, um, that maybe I would still be um, not quite as difficult outwardly, but then, you know, you bottle it up. So exactly, <laughs> that's, not, that's not healthy either. So. No. And I think, and how many of us cry when we're angry? Oh yeah, all the time. You know, I mean, as opposed to just being angry or, <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, I think men are better at this. You know, you acknowledge your anger, but then you decide how much you want to like, you know, express it, right? But I think women, once we become angry, it just is, you know, like a fire hose and then you're crying and then you're, you know, and I don't, I, did, I wanted to work to be able to express my anger, be the, you know, do what I wanted to do, be in my place, be called difficult and then be like, fine, you know, let's, but I don't agree. And uh, it's still a work in progress. 
because I still sometimes go like, oh, just say yes, just yeah, 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 okay, whatever. When I really don't want to say yes, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's really really assuring to hear. Like I thought that was just um, me being no. sensitive or whatever, but like I can't get through an argument without sounding either sounding like I'm tear like gonna tear up or actually like having to excuse myself because I can't continue, you know, this disagreement without crying right now, um, which is so unfair. Like I always joke around, like I could rule the world if I could just like, you know, well, and you know argue with someone I, without breaking out in tears. <laughs> but I also think, you know, we should, you know, if that's, I, I, I mean, on the other hand, I don't think we should apologize for crying. You know, I think that, that you know, anger is a powerful emotion and, and, you know, we express it how we express it. On the other hand, I do wish that it, it always didn't prompt this meltdown because we felt so um, either guilty or shame or whatever those really heavy feelings are about being angry. Yeah, it's complicated. Um, and I think, you know, the thing is about most of my difficult women is I think that they had, for the most part, and I'm trying to think, I'm like flipping through <laughs> my mental Rolodex. They don't even have Rolodexes anymore. I'm flipping through to think if this is true. But um, they seem to have a greater com a command of a broader range of their own emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and that that was just the deal. You know. So we have um, an anonymous question that kind of ties into what we've been talking about the past couple of minutes. I agree with what you said that it would be great if younger women could get that it's okay to be difficult before they're in their fifties. Um, how can we encourage that? How could how can we encourage that? Um, well, I I think you know. Um, I, it's important to try because, you know, the thing is we, you know, we all live our lives, especially in the pandemic. It's like, it's like in 15 minute increments, we're all in this house together and things are happening. And, you know, so, so it's, it's never going to be a perfect, um, a, a, you know, a, it's never going to be perfect, but I just think, you know, that helping girls, and, you know, it's true for boys too. I mean, they have other problems, but, but I just think all humans encouraging them to just understand that um, when they behave in a way that maybe, like I said, makes people around them not comfortable or inconvenient, that it's, that there's no judgment on it and there's no shame and there's no disapproval. Um, I think obviously, you know, we don't want to, you know, create psychopaths, but, but certainly women, you know, as we are raised that are, what is, what, it, you know, the, the behavior that, that we approve of is very limited. And I think if you can just open it a little bit, um, that it really helps. It leads to a whole cultural discussion. Um, right. I so your book and like there are other books I've read that are similar to your book where you know it's kind of a collective biography um and a lot of a lot more of those have come out in recent years especially just centered around women that's really helpful like um generationally I'm I'm a millennial I'm in my 30s so um like and it's I'm starting to come into my own but I feel like if I had more books like that growing up maybe I wouldn't have been so self-conscious about, you know, inconveniencing someone because they're doing something wrong. Um, right, right. You know? I mean, I think younger women, I think millennials, I think all that you, you guys are years ahead of, or miles ahead, whatever we want, <laughs> light years ahead of, of older generations. And, you know, I think it's super interesting. Um, Caitlin Moran, who wrote a great book, she's a British author called How to Be a Woman which is hilarious and everyone should read it. But she also wrote a book now called, now that she's like in her forties called More Than a Woman. Um, and she really talks of what, what, and it's hilarious and great and everyone should read it. But there's a chapter that she talks about in the last hundred years, if you look at where women have come in a hundred years versus men, like men's lives have not changed. 
in 100 years. She said, other, other than that, people don't wear, top, men don't wear top hats, except for slash. But, um, um, but women, every generation, there is something new, some new, new um, freedom, like a literal legal freedom, a little literal political freedom, a sociological freedom. I mean, we are, if you just look back two generations, your grandmother's life was completely different. And, you know, the societal expectations, um, you know, even if you look at, uh, you know, this is maybe a little far afield, but I think it's interesting is that, like, even when I was growing up, um, you know, girls could be like, like you could be cute like the girl next door, or you could be cute like a sporty girl, or you could be cute like a surfer girl. I grew up in California, but now you have to be hot, like hot, hot is the only thing. That is the only thing. Now, I didn't quite have that, even though it was a more repressed time, there were still, I think, a few more acceptable types of feminine beauty. But now you just have to be hot. And I, you know, I would not want to be under that pressure that young women to be hot. <laughs> um, because again, again, what does that do? That also limits the way that we um, feel like we need to be perceived. Yeah. Again, it's limiting. Um, and I think that just like I said, making things less limited helps on all fronts. That was really a tangent, but as well, a difficult woman, I am allowed a tangent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have another question. Do you consider yourself a feminist? And why is that word so loaded and misunderstood? Um, I do consider myself a feminist. My dad, my dad was the feminist in the family, which is kind of interesting. Um, and his definition of it was your life is as important as any boy's life, as, is as important as any boy's life. Um, I think it's, I mean, I don't know, Rory, what do you think as a millennial? Like, I think it's like, I think it's semantics. It's like an old, really, it's, like, yeah. it's like an old lady word, but I mean, the, what's behind it is not objectionable. I just think it's, it, it needs some refreshing. It's just a quality. Like, some, like some just, I used to be a teacher and there was, um, there was a point when I was student teaching and I had a gender studies class, which was like awesome for me. Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm very much a feminist. Um, but we were talking about what, how do you, how would you define it? You know, what is a feminist? And there were all sorts of like, some of them, crazy answers, like just out of, you know, out of air, like, um, and I, and I basically said, you know, if you look in the, if you look in the dictionary, if, if you want equal rights for men and women, you're, you're a feminist, like boys can be like, half the class didn't know men could be feminists too. So um, it's that word, Scott, um, it, yeah, hearing a lot of baggage, and I, it needs a lot of clarification for people, because people, yeah, it does get considered loaded, but I don't know. I feel like um, most people I know, I would say, are feminists. Right. That's really a big step towards egalitarianism and, you know, fixing a lot of the stuff that's wrong in the country and the world. Um, but well, exactly. And I mean, you know, it, feminism, you know, and one can get pretty deep into it, not just the United States, but globally that um, there have been numerous studies, studies have shown, as they say, um, that, you know, once you raise the education level of women in, in all capacities, the economic and health of the family goes up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that, that boys and girls should be educated um, the same, they should have the same financial opportunities, they should have the same economic opportunities. I mean, that raises all the boats, as they say. Um, so yes, I'm a, I, I, I'm a feminist. I have a daughter in, in her 20s and she's a feminist. I think there was a little window, maybe in the late 90s or early 2000s, when, when, when young women were like, I'm not really a feminist, but then I never wanted, we, I would get in conversations, I would say, well, then what, 
So do you feel like your life is worth less than a boy's? And they would say no. And I said, that's all I'm talking about. Yeah. I encountered that a lot growing up. <laughs> right? Like, um, was there another part to that question? But yeah, I do. Um, definitely. Uh, no, just like, why, why do we think it's, it's misunderstood? Um, but I think you pretty effectively uh, address that. Um, what did I want to ask? Oh, so there's, there are several exceptions to this, but it seems that the book tends to primarily center around like North American and then European women. Um, would you ever consider a sequel with with women from other areas of the world? And, and if so, who might you profile? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I take back all that I said just 10 minutes ago about being exhausted from the idea of writing um, more biographies. Um, you know, I, I think, frankly, Rory, I would have to do research because, you know, when this, when I started writing this, as I said, you know, it was something that was really just very, very close to my heart. So, you know, as a white woman, frankly, who grew up in the United States in a certain time, um, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't really exposed that much to these sort of foundational difficult women. Um, and, you know, I, um, I was a huge, huge reader of biographies and, um, you know, my found, what I call my foundational difficult women like Frida Kahlo and, and Amelia Earhart and Jane Goodall. Um, you know, these were women whose life stories I read when I was young. Like my parents got National Geographic and I remember when Jane Goodall was on the cover. It was like, oh, look at her. She's so cute in her shorts with those chimps. I just want to be like that, you know. Um, probably being punished for being difficult was, you know, thrown in the corner with some natural geographics, but, but, um, you know, so those were the women that I had grown up with. So I think I would have to throw the net wide and just get out more because yes, they're, they are changing the world. Um, I don't know if Malala is too young to be considered. A, no, she's older now. She was 13. She's older now. I think she's, it could be a difficult woman for sure. Malala. Well, you didn't uh, even at 13, you know. Well, that is true. I think we talked about including her. I think we must have. But anyway, yeah, so there's a lot of back and forth about, you know, <laughs> who, who, who will be included. But I think that's actually a really kind of a great idea. There, to tack on to that, there's a question um, from the audience that kind of suggests like it would be interesting to read like a book about difficult, difficult Arab American women or, or yeah. difficult, you know. I do think it's a great idea. Different areas. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, and this is maybe obvious and it's one of those things, you know, that I, I obviously knew and then, you know, um, but, but, you know, your lived experience obviously is much different from knowing it, but but just being in Europe and having, um, you know, the ability to go to Morocco, we're in the deep, deep south of France, and it's a day away, you know, so the world and all those women, difficult women in it are close. And you get much, a, a much better sense that, that, you know, what's going on globally living, um, living in Europe, I think. So I, I'm going to start making a list. I think that's a great <laughs> That's something I noticed too about, like, I think we were talking before and I told you, I had studied in Oxford for a semester. And um, that was one of the things that really struck me as exciting was like, oh, what are you doing this weekend? Someone was going to Amsterdam. And I'm like, you, you know, yeah. you don't you don't like hang out in Connecticut and like, oh, I'm just gonna go, you know, I'm just gonna go to Canada for the weekend. <laughs> and then next weekend, I'm gonna go to Mexico. Like, so that was new to me, but it's really like, you know, the proximity is like, traveling to another state and that's so cool like yeah. I got to to Wales you could go to Ireland for like 30 bucks on an airplane and come back the same day like um yeah that's something I really miss about about being there and um I wish I I could go back maybe when things are safe yes and um there's better there's yes there's better news that things are opening up um just yesterday we learned um that France will now be open to um, the UK, which all the borders have been closed. So things are definitely um, opening up. 
So I'm feeling a little, a little, I'm feeling a little optimistic. Um, we have a, we have a question, Karen, are you working on a new project? I know you had just published a book, um, yeah, last year. I did. I published a book. It was kind of, uh, you know, a, a book that came from having written this and it was called, yeah, no, not happening. And it was about, it was an anti self-improvement manifesto. Um, and, um, because I think I decided after having done, you know, studied with all these, studied all these difficult women that I was done trying to itself, not trying to improve myself, but it, um, you know, it did come out in the middle of the pandemic and my book tour and everything was canceled. And, um, but yes, I, so I, there was a book that came out in May. Um, actually right now I'm working on a novel. And I mean, I have, I have kind of a hybrid memoir that I'm, that's in progress, but I'm, I'm sort of focused on writing a novel right now. Have you fleshed that, the story out or? Um, no. Still in <laughs> Novels and I think fiction in particular are um, a magic act. And the more you talk about it, the more your magic sort of seeps out, so. Hopefully it will be in bookstores well, or wherever books are these days. In bookstores soon. I mean, they're, they're wherever they are on Amazon, on bookshop.org. It's exciting. We'll look forward to that. Um, do we have any other questions? We're sort of nearing one o'clock. Um, if anyone has another question, just let us know in the, the Q&A or the comments in Facebook or the, the chat here. You know, I would like to say one thing. Yeah. Um, you know, these the women that I wrote about, and they didn't necessarily live lives without suffering. Um, but I think to live a life in which you have not been true to yourself and had may, have made a habit of it, that that's a particular kind of pain mm -hmm. um and and i i i talked about this in the in yeah no not happening the other book there was that very famous um hospice nurse who interviewed a lot of the patients that she was taking care of as they were dying and she i think it started out as a blog post she wrote about what were the top five regrets that people had as they were dying and it i think it became a book and um, her name was Bronnie Ware. I believe she was Australian. But the top one was that I was not truer to myself. A version of that, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. And so I just think that there's an ex a special exquisite kind of suffering when you have denied yourself so much so that no one, so, that, so you don't upset the people around you kind of a, a beautiful way to close it up <laughs> you know it's well, very important like being true to yourself um that's something and it's, not that, and it's not that by the way we have we have people in our lives that we love and children god knows and and we want to be generous and we want to be nurturing because that's sort of what it means to be a human so it's not like i'm advocating just be selfish but <laughs> um but there are, and I think we all know when we're denying who we are because we don't want to be called difficult or we don't want anyone to think ill of us. Um, I think we know. And, and those are the things I think that, that we should try not to do. Uh, we do have one more question. Pat asks, do you think the word difficult comes from the male power structure in the world? Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a word that it works, right? Um, because you know, think about you know, oh, you're just now you're just being beautiful, like uh oh, like that difficult, it makes us feel bad. So of course, you know, um, I mean, I have friends. Some of my most beloved friends are difficult, and I know they're difficult, but I love them. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's, but, but I think when it comes from sort of the patriarchy and as we talk of the patriarchy, it's not necessarily men right now, but it's that structure, mm -hmm. um, that of course it comes because it keeps us in line. I think most of my friends are 
would be considered difficult to, but I think of how boring it would be if everyone was just super agreeable all the time. That would drive me nuts. Right. Um, and nothing would ever get done. You know, we would never do anything. Well, you know, and that's one of the things that I love about living in France is that you, you, there's a bit more freedom for women to be, um, to, to, to be confrontational and to have their own opinions and to be provocative because they think it's more interesting. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm gonna wrap this up. We're kind of approaching the closing hour. Uh, just wanted to say a book sandwiched in is made possible by gifts to the New Haven Public Library Foundation. If you enjoyed the program, please consider making a donation at NHFPL slash donate um, to help support our collections, programs, and services throughout the year. Our next BSI will feature Gerald Meyer who's got a presentation titled Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia in the Left, and that's co-sponsored by the Vito Marcantonio Forum. It's happening next Thursday at noon. Uh, and please join us on Monday at seven uh, to discuss COVID-19 with um, another strong or difficult woman, Sabra Klein. She is a Johns Hopkins virologist and microbiologist. Wow. Uh, and her actual area of focus is how the different um, sexes, immune systems uh, respond to viruses. Um, so that should be interesting. Links to all of our programs are available at nhfpl.org on our website. Uh, and thank you so much, Karen, for, for joining us all the way from Europe. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Rory. It was really great. And